The central United States is the tornado's playground. Meteorologists come from all over the world because this is where they happen. From Texas all the way up to Nebraska and into Canada is what's known as Tornado Alley. And usually starting in early April through the summer is what they call the storm season. The 50-year storm that's coming. We were in the hottest tornado spot in the world at the hottest tornado time, and it was scary. I want the audience to feel the same amazement as what the storm chases feel. Get us out, get us out of here. Okay, we're in the window. Here we go. Okay. In the summer of 1995, during the heat of storm season, the director of Speed, Jan de Bant, along with producers Kathleen Kennedy, Michael Crichton, and Ian Bryce, set out to capture the dark side of nature on film. The result is Twister, the latest film from Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. It tells the story of two recently separated meteorologists, played by Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton who were brought together again by the threat of the 50-year storm, a deadly system that threatens to drop multiple tornadoes into central Oklahoma. The NSSL says the cap is breaking. Towers are going up 30 miles off the dry line. All right, let's go. I'm playing this woman who's, while everyone else is scared and running away from a storm, she wants to, like, see inside of it and go toward it, and fear is just not in her, in her vocabulary. For these storm chasers, it's the chance of a lifetime, an opportunity to launch a tracking device nicknamed Dorothy that can unlock the secrets inside nature's most mysterious killer. We put her up inside a tornado. She opens and releases hundreds of these sensors that measure all parts of the tornado simultaneously. I'm a guy who walked away from it. I'm a gunfighter who left the gunfight. When I go back to see my ex-wife, Helen Hunt, to get the divorce paper signed, I've got my fiance in tow. I realize that since I've seen her, she's become even more obsessed. Did you sign papers? She didn't? Come on, Phil, we can still catch him. Phil, Brad, you're back! I'm not back! I sort of hold them ransom if he goes on this one final chase with me. Dusty, the battle zone should be northeast of 81. Got Wait you, a minute, Joe. the battle zone? Billy, what are we doing? We're going again. It's very fun to get to play a relationship that's already fueled by a lot of rage and love and a mixed bag of emotions. OK, guys, let's go get it. Add to this mix a rival storm chasing team headed by Carrie Elways, dead set on getting to the twister first, and you have the makings of an incredible, terrifying ride. It's that cat and mouse chase with the weather, with this great ominous thing that these storm chasers deal with, and that's where the rush comes from. People tend to say that the speed was a very fast-moving picture. I think this one is a little quicker. <laughs> Traveling hundreds of miles throughout Tornado Alley, the line between the script, written by Michael Crichton and Anne Marie Martin, and reality, began to blur. The production found itself surrounded by the same violent weather they were portraying on screen. We could see on our portable Doppler that we had a supercell moving toward us. And in fact, not only was it moving toward us, it was literally bearing right down on us. It's exhilarating because what's happening around you is completely and totally beyond your control. The night before we started shooting, there was an awesome thunderstorm, thunder and lightning storm. And as an actor, you always hope that there'll be some omen that you were born to play the part or that you're, you know, perfectly suited. The night before this movie started, I was lying in my bed going, if there were a tornado coming, I would run the other way. Lightning came out, and man, it was the loudest storm, and it was really powerful. The idea of people going out there chasing tornadoes tells you a lot about a person. On the very same day the Twister cast and crew hit the road, their real-life counterparts, the storm chasers from Vortex, had their sights set on the real thing. 
an offshoot of the National Severe Storm Lab, the team of scientists was tracking a massive storm system that had formed over the Texas Panhandle, just south of the production. The mission today is to uh, document the near-tornado thermodynamic fields. Using a caravan of 20 vehicles, two airplanes and a command vehicle manned by the team leader, Eric Rasmussen, the Vortex team was able to pinpoint the tornado's touchdown, a terrifying place where in the middle of the day, it looks like night. Uh, it's still too dangerous for us to get out. There's an adrenaline rush to doing all this. You know, some guys like to go and, and, and surf the bonsai pipeline. Some guys are in the hang gliders. These guys are into chasing tornadoes. And it's almost like chasing a rogue murderer. It's one of the most terrifying sights a human being can witness. Almost 345 degrees. The tornado we saw Friday was so strong that it peeled the asphalt off of a, of a highway and threw it 600 feet out through a field. We need emergency crews here. Uh, houses have been hit over. Get us, out, get us out of here. I'm serious. I know. Not only have the storm chasers of Tornado Alley begun to unravel the physics behind the violent storms, through the increased use of video cameras, they have also captured some of the most terrifying images ever seen. It was this kind of urgency combined with the excitement of discovery that Jan de Bont wanted to capture in Twister. The production became its own storm chasing unit, ready on a moment's notice to move if the weather was right, or in this case, wrong. I wanted to have this feel, feel of a, almost like a documentary that like those guys are really doing. They had this one day, and then this day they had to get there. And it gives it a very unique look to the movie. We're driving due east on a country road. He's been on for about six miles. We got an M3 tune sitting on the ground. Woohoo! I always feel that beauty gets in the way of the content, and I want to forget the beauty. I want to just go right to the heart of the story. We're getting slammed in here, guys. You better hang back. Time for deployment, guys. Let's do it. Sometimes when I didn't know what to do with this character, I decided I was playing Jan. Just, just focused and fearless. To recreate the violence of winds that can reach 300 miles an hour, DeBant again went for realism. Bring the wind up. Using the jet engine from a 707, massive fans, and even a turning rig that allowed Bill and Helen to be swept up by the force of the tornado. I knew reading the script it wasn't going to be, you know, like a easy picnic of a shoot. Here we go. Scenes when Helen and Bill drive straight into the storm, DeBont rigged up a caravan of semi-trucks spewing debris and ice chunks over the camera car and onto the actor's truck. Just before the tornado happened, there's others use hailstorm. So I said, I have to have a real hailstorm scene in the movie. I wish I'd never thought about it. We couldn't get any hail in, in all of Oklahoma, so we had to import it from a neighboring state. We had like four or five 40-foot trailers moving at the same time. Ten seconds later, all the ice is gone, all the debris is gone, and we have to go back to one. It took forever to shoot that scene. Stand by to roll. All right, guys, everybody knows the truck's going to be barely running through here, so nobody should be close to the side of the road. Let's pull out, everybody, please. Everybody pull out. Hey, sir. Well, here we are. This is pretty real. I don't have to do a lot of acting in, in this movie. You know, they're raining basically chipped ice on me. They're throwing debris. I mean, although it's, it's lightweight stuff, it still hits, it still hurts. It's exciting stuff. This is why I signed up. It's a very physical role. OK, she's almost ready. It really looks like the end of the world. They built a set using existing buildings and buildings they built for the establishing shot, and then they tore down. I'd say it was seven square blocks, and they just reduced this place to rubble, and they had got literally cars and trees, and they um, copied a lot of famous tornado photographs. 
for blocks and blocks and blocks. We were walking through rubble up to our knees. It was just really bizarre. So we need some hanging wires, electric power lines. They can spark so that when we look this way behind them, they have this shower of sparks behind them. They had no warning. Even just to create very, very small scenes took a phenomenal amount of manpower and equipment. And it really made all of us step back and realize how nature itself can create this on such a massive scale and we were putting all our energy into just creating what would exist in the frame. This is Topeka, Kansas, and this is the aftermath of the most destructive tornado ever to strike the state capitol. It sliced a path of death and damage a half mile wide and 15 miles long. Tree just blew over. The nature of the tornado and the reason it is able to destroy so much so quickly is that it is completely unpredictable, able to turn on the observer in the blink of an eye. It was this unpredictability that led DeBont to Industrial Light and Magic, the computer effects facility owned by George Lucas. It was a rare chance to control the uncontrollable. It should be a lot lower. We wanted to make it be as realistic as possible. We have so many tapes of real tornadoes, but always, again, seen from a distance. You never see the inside of a tornado, which we hopefully going to see for the first time in this movie. It's kind of really a new wave in terms of saying we can do everything in the computer because all the cars that are flying, all the houses, you know, the, the spinning house onto a road, and, and all the tanker and everything, that's all computer graphics. Are you going to make this then? The quality of computer imaging and the CGI is so incredible right now that you almost have to. Um, make it look like there were little mistakes in it. It's too perfect almost. We add the level of shake to it so that it builds up. The closer the tornado comes, the more intense that shake becomes. It's in the eye of the beholder, you know, whether it's a monster that's coming to get you or a force of nature to be listened to or something fascinating or something terrifying. I think what makes it a good thing to make a movie about is it's all of those things. If they just get 10% of that feeling, then you still will be enormous, will be still fantastic. <laughs> we as, as, as a society, uh, people just in general have an innate fascination with these storms, these, these tornadoes are just so captivating to look at. And here we're throwing the audience right into the middle of them, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be a hell of a ride. The fear is real. The terror is unimaginable, and destruction is imminent. You're at the mercy of one of Mother Nature's most erratic and destructive children, the tornado. Tighten your seatbelt. <laughs> to witness a tornado is a spectacular sight. To live through its wake is another story. Join us as we take a thrilling ride into the eye of a storm. What occurs is kind of like what occurred in April 3rd and 4th of 1974, what they call a super outbreak, where tornadoes from a storm system were literally 148 tornadoes were formed and dropped over about 11 state area, killing about 350 people. And so the tornadoes start out fairly small, but then each one becomes progressively larger and they kind of herald the king. The filmmakers of Twister went to great lengths to recreate the destructive nature of actual tornadoes. I wanted to, 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 to get a very realistic look of it. I looked at tons and tons of films of documentaries about those tornado chases and about what sort of tornadoes look like. 
and, and it's all very rough. And I wanted to get the feeling you now for the audience that they were really participating in this movie, that they were making the same kind of trip, you know, through all those, those, those wild circumstances to get there. The realistic environments created by the art and special effects departments enabled the cast to experience the violent unpredictability of a severe storm front. Just to walk around that and just see how close it looks to the footage that, that I've seen, it's uncanny. And I think even the locals are kind of stunned. They're like looking around, they're going, my God, I guess this is what would happen if a tornado hit us. What a movie like this does, it only gives you more respect for nature. Because as you're trying to duplicate just a little tiny scene, what it is you have to put into that to even come close to what the actual event would look like is phenomenal. Creating the spectacular sets and practical effects were only one piece of the puzzle. Visualizing the various twisters that were called for in the script proved to be a formidable challenge. An F5, which is like the most powerful tonight, it can go more than a mile wide, and this wind speed of up to 300 miles an hour inside the core, which is like two to three times as strong as the biggest hurricane, you know, it totally pulverizes everything. Nothing is left. It's like it never even existed before. So the power is un unbelievable. What I think Jan has done to bring people as close to a tornado as you'd ever want to get without ever having to hurt yourself whatsoever. And it's ominous. I mean, the footage that ILM has done, it's wild. It's just a wild ride. This challenge to create the over 300 intricate visual effect shots needed for the film was taken on by Stephen Fangmeyer and his fellow wizards at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic in Northern California. We have done a lot of testing before we started the movie because we wanted to make absolute sure that you could do that in a realistic way. And the test turned out to be very good, very successful, and that kind of convinced us to make the movie, basically. Kind of another breakthrough, which is kind of nice, because the movie being shot in a documentary way, the effects has to have the same feeling to it. It's, it's very, very hard to do. Before production began, painstaking research was conducted to make sure that the tornadoes depicted in Twister would look and react like their real-life counterparts. I think every sequence has a different looking tornado and there's a lot of reference out there and what we have found that hardly any tornado in that reference, which are mostly sort of home videos, unfortunately because quality isn't so great that we can just imagine what the thing would look like if we ever captured anything on high quality film. But there's a lot of range out there, so we spend a lot of time looking at those tapes and figuring out, okay, what is interesting about particular tornadoes. It starts out as a line, a tornado would be much as its spine sort of moving along, and we often determine the speed, the travel of it, also its sort of movement, how does it deform on, on this axis, animating just that, that spine, so to speak. And then we fill in with the particles the motion of the debris and the, the, the air molecules around that spine. Since a lot of our work previously has been that we model a certain surface, like a creature, like a T-Rex, now with a tornado, a tornado isn't really a, a confined surface like that, and it's just sort of dust moving around. You really have to show that it's made out of, out of billions of trillions of little particles and have them all behave by a certain rule set with, of course, some turbulence built in. So it's really moving a lot of particles and, and clumps them together to make it look at, with the different color ranges to sort of make it look like debris. Once the initial wireframe models were created and approved, they became fully realized, taking on color, form, and texture. All the live action elements were then combined to form a finished or composite shot. Creating realism and scope was essential to the filmmakers. Besides generating the actual twisters, objects such as tractors, tankers, and even a cow, which normally would be impossible to capture and control, were easily created in the computer environment. Sometimes, even Mother Nature needs to be pushed. ILM also enhanced numerous scenes, transforming picture-perfect shooting days into storm-filled ones. Each stage of the process was then presented to director Jan de Bond for his approval. After months of intense post-production, the Twister team at ILM finally let their efforts speak for themselves. And Jan is really sort of, his curve just keeps on going up, you know, until the end of the film. And his dynamics is once, you know, he says go, 
you know, really got to keep that level up in the film. So every shot, more or less, really has to be pretty pumped up. And that's kind of fun when, once you get into that spirit and understand it. It's kind of fun to just sort of play everything out that way. And it's really a different way. It feels in some way more like you're going on a ride. And I think it makes our work with Jan so excellent, you know, our cooperation is that we sort of understand his style. And I think he appreciates also all the things we can put in that he just on, on location could have never planned out at that point in time or really executed there. Yeah. Okay. What makes Twister so exciting, I think, is the fact that tornadoes are unpredictable and they shoot down at any moment and you're chasing it. You're basically chasing the weather. It's man against nature. You're basically driving that car at one point. You're one of those guys, the audience is one of those chasers and, 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 and trying to search for that tornado. It's like we all want to see, want to be close to danger. We don't get too close, but close enough so that we get the adrenaline going. I think whenever you can deal with phenomenal natural events, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, things like that, we tend to think of them as being extraordinarily beautiful at the same time that they're extremely dangerous. And in this case, tornadoes are incredibly fascinating. And the minute you see the sky and the lightning and then the formation of a tornado, you can't take your eyes off it. Patch the camera to it. And we, then we had a big fan underneath it, and then and it rode with it. So as that ring went around and the camera went with it, they actually were just like hanging upside down. But camera-wise, it looked like they were going straight up into the eye of the tornado. The actors would go all the way to the top, and then they really hang. It, so it looks like they're being pushed from the top, which I had wind machines all around, so that as they got higher, the wind would come from the right direction. And that worked fantastic. Okay, having a look, let's stand by, please. Really, the big thing about Twister that people might not realize, the way it was photographed was really uh, uh, quite much more dynamic and sort of uh, quite freer than visual effects before were really done. We really didn't do any blue screen for the movie at all. So all the things where we had to put the tornadoes behind the running people, it, it kind of comes down to digital paint work where you kind of rotoscope. It's very hard work, but I think it was absolutely necessary to make this film seem real, that you really were there. The most difficult thing in those days is what people don't remember, is that originally when you make a movie with facial effects in those days, you put the camera on a tripod, you lock it off, and you make very little pants. Well, there's one thing we're going to have to change this camera will never be on the tripod because, you know, you cannot get a sense of danger and action and, and, and incredible change, quick changes, if I cannot put this camera on my shoulder. We made a lot of tests while we were shooting and see if we could do it. One other thing that I really enjoyed later on in post was actually when we had to come down to what those twisters are gonna look like, is helping to design the look of the twisters. Now the thing we did certainly for research was to gather all the footage we could. The biggest problem was that of course it's very difficult to find any film footage because they are so unpredictable. Jan watched a lot of that obviously as well too to really duplicate that experience of how chaotic it is and all the different elements in it. And so our approach was to sort of look at that and then say okay now how would that look on film? How does it fit in the landscape and where does it connect? Because if you don't have it connect, if you don't see this interaction between where it hits the ground and, and the ground itself, then it's not going to work. Then it becomes just like a, an object that's just put in there. And that was difficult. They had sort of a storm unit that actually started filming, I think a month before and drove down all the, the panhandle there from Oklahoma to Texas and to just get some footage of huge storm fronts. And we were able to use some of those. Where other sequences, for instance, Hailstorm Hill, where they're driving up the hill and then the hail starts happening, they try to get the Dorothy off the truck. That whole swirling sky enough, that was all computer generated because there was literally nothing up there but blue sky or gray sky at least, you know. And so sometimes we had to create it all and sometimes we were able to use something that was there as a sort of a starter kit. We do not have a visual, help us out here. 
we did have a lot of reference and, and there were a lot of different looks. And they always do look different. It always depends also what they're going through, what kind of color earth they're picking up and you know how much water content is there and how much of a speed do they travel and the wind speed inside of them. So you try to use all of those and then it's really you know working with somebody like Jan also to articulate that. That one in the end was probably like a wall of elephants coming through. Run! Well, some of the other ones were much more elegant in a way. I thought the water funnels were sort of like, you know, you could sort of say like water fairies dancing out there in their own little mysterious dance. Now animating them really, it's actually a fairly simple task in terms of their movement because you're just really animating a little string around which you build the tornado. So in that terms of animation, it was in easy, but then creating the tornado around it was a hard part. Instead of having a solid surface, you're really using a completely different approach to represent mass. I mean, the mass of a tornado, which is literally billions and billions and billions of particles. None of this existed when we started, and Twister was certainly in the technology created for it, a tremendous foray for industrial light magic into using particle systems to that extent. What, are you doing? what I really want to make sure is that the threat was growing. You know, during the course of the movie, the audience understands what it really means, a tornado. And you start with a small one. So you're taught a little bit what a small one can do. So you set up a little bit then what a bigger one could do. Whoa! I really wanted to create characters because they are talking to the Twister. They see it as a character themselves. It's something they battle. So they take it personal. You've never seen him miss this house and miss that house and come after you. So it was for me very important to create a character for every different twister. Okay, we got sisters. You read a lot of different accounts of what happens in tornadoes. And I think there was really one where a farmer had said that he had missed some of his cattle and then it found, was found literally 20 miles away. So it was sort of reconstructed that the tornado had actually picked them up, but also put them back down in a relatively gentle fashion because they were still alive. And that's where the cow came from. I remember doing the flying cow sequence and Jan was trying to coordinate so that me and Helen and Jamie, our, our eye line is going the same length. The key thing is how do the actors relate to something they don't see because that's the one thing they could not see in the set. I could not on the set create the actual twister. So basically I kind of had to act it out, you know, and I, I was running around where the twister was and with bullhorns and and so that they had, the actors had some sort of react to. He goes, Bill, Bill, no, no, you're, you're not watching here. The cow is flying, here it comes, here it comes. Follow the hand, follow the fingers. It comes around, now it's coming around again. Now you're lying. Here comes the cow flying by again. It's so funny because that is such a popular moment in the movie, especially with young kids and stuff. They love the flying cow. I told Jan my version would be, in, in the gothic version, the cow would fly by once and then you wouldn't see the cow again. And then about 15 seconds it would just rain hamburger meat down on the car as the barometric pressure just exploded the cow. As a visual effects person, you really never hear the sound. It's moving fast! Coming towards you, Joe! Since that is going on in parallel, most of the time you don't really know it. And so I was very happy to hear then later on, you know, that that was such a successful combination. Although I was certain that would happen. Bill! Get out! Look out! Come on! Hurry! I think it's really important that your antagonist has a personality. And, and basically we have six of those, so, and that personality had to change. So I really felt very strongly about creating different sound effects for each one. And we started recording lots of different sounds and made a gigantic uh, library of sound effects. We all started, started, we started recording lions, these, uh, all kinds of animal screams. 
breaking boards, uh, big um, like crashing cars into walls. And ultimately, all those things mixed and slowed down and mixed together, we started creating different effects. I wanted the tornado to talk to them. I wanted to, to get a sense like it's a living thing. But it was a really great effect because really the, uh, the theater was shaking. It's still really good. I think it's still one of the best sound effect movies in a long time. I think even at now it still holds up very, very well sound effect wise. One of the great themes is man versus nature. It will always hold our fascination. There's a fear, there's also a sense of wonderment. The forces of nature are humbling to behold and terrifying. There's a fear of tornadoes like there is of sharks. It's a primordial thing. It's almost in our genetic code. People are fascinated. It's kind of like one of those things where you're afraid, but you're, you're almost so compelled by the awesome nature of, of seeing a tornado that you might become almost mesmerized by it to the point where you, you forget you're, you're in mortal danger. Get underground! Take her right now! Go! Having such a great cast and crew is the best memories of the making of the movie. They all were, were like a team because everybody had the, the same struggle. Nobody had anything more than the other person. We all were the same, you know, it's like we're spread over like God knows 30 little hotels and we still all have dinner together. It was, it was the best time and crew-wise and cast-wise, one of the best movies I worked on. dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. Yes, yes, coming down right now, major tornado. How do you contain the uncontainable? Oh my God, there it is. There's a tornado right there. They are the most violent winds known to mankind, swirling to the ground at more than 300 miles per hour and destroying virtually everything in their path. And yet science and technology is casting its net to make order from this terrifying chaos. From satellites in space, to advanced radars on the ground, the chase has begun. There is little in nature more violent than the explosive destruction of a tornado as it strikes the Earth's surface. Oh my God, I know it! A thousand of these ferocious windstorms strike the United States each year, killing about 50 people. But in the past, the annual death toll often reached hundreds. For generations, the terror left behind by these monstrous storms came not only from the devastation, but from fear of the unknown. Today, Weathercasters can warn people an average of 11 minutes before a tornado is likely to strike. But once, there was no notice at all. The lucky ones caught sight of an approaching tornado in just enough time to seek shelter. But understanding and predicting tornadoes has been an ongoing scientific quest. 
achieving steady progress for the last half century. Our understanding of tornadoes has advanced amazingly in the last 50 years. We're right now at the point where we can identify the conditions that are likely to produce the most significant tornadoes fairly well and fairly far in advance. Scientists believe the cause of tornadoes begins with wind shear, which results from winds at different heights blowing either at different speeds or from different directions. Wind shear produces horizontal rotation. Most tornadoes in the U.S. form in the spring when masses of cool, dry air from the north meet warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. The warm air rises, creating a powerful updraft, along with clouds reaching up to 10 miles high. If wind shear rotation is present, the updraft tilts it from horizontal to vertical. The result is a supercell, a towering thunderstorm with a strong region of rotation two to six miles wide. This large rotation is called a mesocyclone, an important word to tornado forecasters. Unfortunately, it isn't known just how a mesocyclone turns into a tornado. It is a serious gap in the current science. We are entirely incapable of predicting exactly what storm will produce a tornado and uh, if a storm will produce a tornado or not. Technology has been in pursuit of the tornado's mysteries for more than a century. In 1884, when still cameras were considered high-tech, the first photographs of tornadoes were taken. Motion pictures of a tornado didn't appear until a movie camera recorded these scenes near the town of Corn, Oklahoma, in 1951. Today, the primary tool for peering into the depths of the tornado is radar. With their gleaming white protective domes, these modern installations are a far cry from their crude ancestors. World War II technicians always knew they could see storms on their scopes. But in 1947, the Air Force's Thunderstorm Project used radar to study weather systematically for the first time. In 1953, the first hook echo appeared on weather radar at the Illinois State Water Survey. Forecasters would learn to recognize this as a sign of a possible tornado. When there's a hook-like shape in the reflectivity. Today's multicolored radar displays may look different from their predecessors, but the principle of the system is the same. Transmission antennas send out beams of radio waves, and if they strike raindrops or hailstones, the waves are bounced back. In this particular image, uh, what we're seeing is uh, the colors of green and yellow and red represent the intensity of rainfall and hail that's occurring. In 1973, radar technology took a leap forward as the National Severe Storms Laboratory built its first experimental Doppler radar. Doppler is different from conventional radar because it not only measures the amount of rain, it also measures the speed and direction of winds in a storm, something the old radars could not do. Doppler radars today have two different kinds of displays. One is a reflectivity display showing the simple location and intensity of rain. The other is a velocity display showing the speeds of winds in a storm. What we see here is an area of very strong or bright green colors, and those are winds that are flowing strongly toward the radar. Next to that is an area of red, where the winds are flowing away from the radar. Color codes on the radar display give us a clue to the shape of the storm. Doppler radar works like a police officer's radar gun and measures wind speeds coming toward or going away from the antenna dish. If a storm has a strong circular motion, it will show up on the display as a color couplet. Like the hook echo, the Doppler couplet is another telltale clue for tornado forecasters. So what we have is a counterclockwise circulation within the updraft region of this thunderstorm that's approaching Oklahoma City. And this is precisely the type of feature called a mesocyclone that we look for when we're trying to identify storms that have a tornado potential. Doppler radars physically rotate their dishes constantly, 
so they can scan large areas with their beams. 158 weather dopplers are scattered across the country, all connected in a network called NEXRAD for next generation radar. Completed in 1995, NEXRAD teams with advanced weather satellites to give us a complete view of the forces that produce tornadoes. This one's gonna go tornado. Mm -hmm. that, that one right there is mm -hmm. probably ready mm -hmm. to go. I mean, it just looks so favorable down there. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much okay. it. This is the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, where the process of tornado prediction starts. The people in this small room look at the big picture, watching the weather across the whole country. Our job is to forecast where storms are going to be before they form. This is where forecasters may put out a tornado watch, which means tornadoes are possible and people should be on the alert for more warnings to come. Here, one of the most important tools is the current generation of weather satellites. Satellite data 30, 40 years ago was very crude, and sometimes what we would do is we'd only get one picture a day on a facsimile chart. Today, we have such an integrated picture with satellite pictures that are so clear and so detailed that it makes it easier to identify environments and weather patterns that can produce areas of severe weather. While the Storm Prediction Center watches the whole country, local and regional conditions are monitored by more than 100 local offices of the National Weather Service. Here, detection of things such as thunderstorms with mesocyclones result in tornado warnings, which means tornadoes are imminent. The future of tornado technology presently resides in a concrete dome not far from the Severe Storm Lab's original 1973 experimental Doppler dish, now retired and on public display. The new dome houses the flat-faced antenna of the innovative phased array radar, which might replace NEXRAD in 15 or 20 years. Instead of scanning the sky slowly by rotating the dish, this radar plots its fast-moving beam without moving parts electronically. A scan taking six minutes today will take less than one minute in the future, improving tornado warning times dramatically. Warning lead times today are around 11 minutes, okay, on average across the country. We're hoping to increase that to around 22 minutes. But how will those quicker warnings reach the public? For that, the government forecasters largely depend on a proven technology, television. When the Storm Prediction Center or National Weather Service issues a tornado watch or warning, it goes out over the automated National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration radio network. Special NOAA weather radios receive the signals and are commonly purchased by people who live in tornado-prone areas. Yeah, Val, uh, we need you to head north on I-35. But much more of the responsibility for getting the word out ends up in the hands of commercial broadcasters. In Oklahoma, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere, television and radio are basically the source for weather information to the public. The National Weather Service responsibility is get the information out to the, to the media, and we in turn get it to the public. Gary England is the chief meteorologist at Channel 9 KWTV Oklahoma City, in the heart of tornado country. Mike Armstrong is a junior member of the staff. Outside the studio is the station's own unique Doppler radar dome, tornado technology with a different twist than the government's NEXRAD system. The main difference between our Doppler system and NEXTRAD is that ours is real time. With, with NEXTRAD, you have to wait sometimes between six to 10 minutes to get a full picture of what's going on. TV radars are able to work faster because they cover smaller areas than the national NEXTRAD system. I've got a tornado emergency. Let's break immediately. Gary England has been on the weather beat at Channel 9 since 1972 and was instrumental in bringing advanced hardware to the station. The nation's first TV weather radar was installed here in 1973. In 1981, KWTV erected the first operational weather Doppler radar anywhere. 
at a time when it was still experimental at the National Weather Service. And the first ever Doppler tornado warning went out in March of 1982. Okay, we're on Doppler now, and this is a storm near Kanawha, Oklahoma, and it does indicate a mesocyclone, and there has been a tornado sighted with it earlier. And also, This is the hook echo right here. And we can see the tornado itself. This is the actual tornado. You notice as it moves around, it morphs and changes. Today, Doppler radar remains at the heart of tornado technology here. But updated computer software offers a much more detailed picture than ever before. The newest system we have right now really doesn't have a name. We, we sometimes call it M9. We sometimes call it MOAR for mother of all radars. It's getting ready to come right over our station at this particular time. The eye of it passes directly over us. Fortunately, it was in the air. In early May 2003, during a record outbreak, the MOAR radar showed one tornado uncomfortably close to the station. Outside, it was seen by Val Castor, a station crew member called a storm tracker equipped with a camera and sent out to spot tornadoes. This one was headed directly for the KWTV building. Val, are you saying it's over the television station? Yes, I'm saying it's right over Channel 9. Get, get people out of this studio. Get them out of the studio. Here, guys, come on. Here. Here. The station staff rushed to the interior of the building where they'd be the safest. They were lucky that the funnel cloud remained above the station and did not touch down. As they heard reports coming in from storm trackers, the role of human eyes in the technology web became alarmingly clear. There's no radar in existence that can tell you if a tornado's on the ground. It's so important to have people in the field for ground truth. This uh, was the picture that I actually took on May 3rd, 1999, it was the first tornado, first ground shot of any tornado to hit the air in uh, Oklahoma City on this day. Mike Armstrong worked in the field as a storm tracker for the station in 1999 when a massive tornado struck Moore, Oklahoma, just south of Oklahoma City. was said and done, damage from the superstorm totaled $1.2 billion, more than any other tornado in history. Without question, this was considered an F5 tornado using the Fujita scale, which applies the science of numbers to the damage that tornadoes cause. Developed by Professor Ted Fujita in 1971, the scale estimates a tornado's wind speed from the damage it leaves behind. F-Zero tornadoes do little damage, with winds under 73 miles per hour. At F-5, structures are obliterated by winds as high as 318 miles per hour. Mike Armstrong's still photo of the big tornado headed toward Oklahoma City in 1999 reminds us how quickly advanced technology evolves. The photo was transmitted by cell phone. In 1999, that was unheard of. Now you have all these different cell phone companies that uh, give you the option of sending pictures of your friends and family and dogs and cats or anything else for that matter. But at that time, basically no one had that capability really except for uh, people that were in the field using that technology at the time. But others in the field had a different mission. Not sure how strong it is, still looking pretty big. When scientists took radar on the road that day in 1999, they could never guess they'd measure the most powerful tornado winds ever recorded. Damn, that's a monster. Each year during tornado season, you can see truck-mounted radars hitting the road in Norman, Oklahoma. They are deployed by several different research teams jointly run by the University of Oklahoma, the National Severe Storms Laboratory, as well as institutions as far away as the University of Massachusetts. The radar trucks do what the NEXRAD system cannot, 
Instead of waiting for the storm to come to the radar, they take the radar to the storm. What that lets us do is see very fine scale detail. It's as if we're seeing the fingerprints on someone's hand from close up, as opposed to looking at that hand from across a parking lot. Man, that thing is huge. The need to get close to a tornado turns scientists into storm chasers. Researchers have been seriously chasing storms since the early 1970s, but pursuing them with effective radars is more recent. In 1995, the first Doppler on wheels, or Dow trucks, were deployed as part of Project Vortex, a large-scale study to examine the origins of tornado rotation. Josh Werman runs the Dow program. We learned a lot about tornadoes and about tornado structures in Vortex. What we're still trying to learn are the harder questions of exactly how tornadoes form, of how we can distinguish between supercell thunderstorms that are violently rotating from those very similar storms that actually form tornadoes. Scientists have long known that a tornado is a violently rotating column of air touching the ground from a thunderstorm. We used to be taught that tornadoes were akin to gigantic vacuum cleaners, capable of lifting trees out of the ground and houses off their foundations. Research in the field has shown that to be a myth. The major element of a tornado, the major property of a tornado, is its very strong rotation. So mainly a tornado blows, it doesn't suck. But little is known about how tornadoes work, and only now is technology allowing scientists to look inside them. Determining the structure within a tornado is crucial to discovering how tornadoes form, a process called tornado genesis that is still poorly understood. Hi, how are you, Kate? Oh, my God. Damn, that's a monster. Still three plus. Yeah, I hope this doesn't have to go the city. It's going to be strong. Well, we... In 1999, the Dows encountered a massive tornado just outside Oklahoma City. It was, in fact, the very same storm photographed by KWTV spotter Mike Armstrong. No one who saw it could ever forget it. We were able to stop a few times as it was coming towards Oklahoma City. It was a very dramatic thing visually. When we scanned into that storm, we saw alarmingly high wind speeds, uh, wind speeds of about 135 meters per second, uh, which is 301 miles an hour, plus or minus. That's probably plus or minus about 20 miles an hour but those were the highest wind speeds that anybody had ever measured anywhere, either in the jet stream or in a tornado or a hurricane, um, anything like that. Another chase team, led by Professor Howard Bluestein, uses a special high-frequency radar to detect the smallest details of storms. They also encountered the massive 1999 tornado headed toward Oklahoma City. And in their fine-scale radar images, they discovered powerful tornadoes within the tornado. Chris Weiss is a graduate student on the team. A lot of tornadoes, some even say the majority of tornadoes, actually have multiple vortices that rotate around a common core. These multiple vortices have highly concentrated winds that often do the major damage when a tornado strikes. They have never been seen in such detail on radar before. During the 2003 tornado season, Bluestein's team added a new infrared camera to their toolbox. While the radar is measuring rainfall and wind speeds, the new instrument measures temperature and may give us fresh clues in the mystery of tornado formation. It might be that when there's a strong temperature gradient that we don't get tornado formation, and when there's very, very weak temperature gradient, when the temperature is more uniform, we might be more likely to see a tornado to form. At least that's a hypothesis. We can try to verify that using infrared photography. Also known as thermal cameras, their modern development dates to the 1950s, and they are more widely known for their military and police uses. But today's cutting-edge cameras show thunderstorms in a rainbow of colors, each representing a different temperature. The clouds, in light blue, are revealed to be warmer than the dark blue sky surrounding them. The heat energy inside the clouds is the fuel that drives the storm. 
Up till now, we've only had the ability to look straight down at a thunderstorm with a thermal camera from a satellite or else straight up from a ground-based instrument or from aircraft. We've never really taken a camera out, a thermal camera out into the field to look straight at the thunderstorm and try to deduce things about its thermal structure from, from uh, a human angle. The Doppler on wheels trucks use a different technique to examine tornado structure. They are deployed in pairs to gather double Doppler information, scanning a storm from two different directions to get a better three-dimensional view. But a brand new Dow unit came online in 2003 using an unusual flat antenna. The goal is speed, trying to improve on the already fast one-minute scans of the older Dow trucks. What we found is when we're looking at small things and rapidly evolving violent weather, such as tornadoes and tornado genesis, that one minute is just too slow. Current radars scan a volume of sky by sweeping their beams and tilting their dishes on each pass so they measure different slices of a storm with each sweep. The newest Dow can do it six times faster. It sends six beams through the sky at the same time instead of just one. So instead of slicing back and forth 15 times, we can slice through once and get six, slice back again and get 12, maybe go a third time and get 18, and it only took us three swipes. So in about 10 seconds, we can collect an entire three-dimensional image of the tornado during the birth process. As good as their instruments are, the storm chasers face a difficult task. Getting their trucks in the right place at the right time to aim their radar dishes at tornadoes is extremely difficult. As a result, science seems a long way from solving the tornado riddle. To understand how tornadoes form, researchers need to see them from their very beginning to their ends. Well, the radar doesn't look very good. In a decade of storm chasing with high resolution radar, Howard Bluestein has measured many tornadoes but only one for its entire life cycle. Before we really feel that we've made a, a, a contribution, I think we'll need to have seen at least five or 10 uh, such instances. No matter how well the chasers eventually learn what makes tornadoes form, the violent storms will still touch down in our towns and cities, producing scenes like these. And yet, science has a contribution to make in this realm too as technology shows us how our homes and workplaces can take the world's strongest winds. The science of studying the terrifying winds of tornadoes extends beyond the spectacular storms themselves. Advanced technology also comes into play as researchers measure the incredible destruction left on the ground. This piece of hardware was created because scientists have found that flying debris causes more damage than anything else in a tornado. The device is called the Debris Impact Cannon. It operates at Texas Tech University's Wind Science and Engineering Center in the city of Lubbock. The cannon was designed by research associate Russell Carter and built by the center's technical staff. The importance of the cannon is to give us the ability to test wall systems to resist the types of debris that you find in tornadoes. Based on years of studying tornado wreckage, beginning with a tornado that struck Lubbock in 1970, Texas Tech scientists have found the typical flying debris that does the most damage is best represented by a simple 15-foot long 2x4. Before the first impact cannon was designed in 1983, researchers had no way to simulate the impact of tornado-borne debris in the laboratory. Simple in concept, the cannon is built to extreme precision, using compressed air to fire missiles toward targets at exactly 100 miles per hour, shot after shot. After accounting for weight and drag, this is just the speed predicted for a 2x4 in a 250 mile per hour tornado. 
F4 on the Fujita scale. An amazing high-speed camera shows the action in incredible detail, contributing to the exhaustive analysis that takes place inside the impact lab. For every shot fired by the cannon, the team carefully measures and records the results. We want to look at how the missile affected the target when it impacted on the impact side, if it perforated the target, how it exited, and what that damage looks like. In essence, the debris impact cannon is a tornado researcher's tool in the search for the perfect wall, the kind of wall needed for the extra strong safe rooms often built inside new homes in tornado country. The reinforced spaces are designed to help residents survive severe storms. Under scrutiny here is a concrete-filled safe room wall system submitted to Texas Tech for testing by the Royal Light Company of Canada. It is undamaged after repeated shots. This had been your safe room. You would have been perfectly safe on the other side of this wall. Definitely. Although flying debris is responsible for much tornado damage, certainly it all begins with the winds of the storm. A community in the path of a tornado is subject to winds from many directions. The swirling funnel draws air into its updraft from all sides so that a direct hit is not necessary for major damage to occur. One of the weak points in many houses is the garage, where tornadic winds get a toehold. As open space rooms with light framing, garages are relatively weak and are easily obliterated by tornado winds. And that is where another strand of the technological web comes into play, the wind tunnel. In another laboratory at Texas Tech, Dr. Chris Letchford and his students are studying how builders can design houses to better resist tornadoes. The specialized device used to study the swirling structure of tornadoes looks nothing like the long, narrow tunnels we might expect. To analyze the twisting winds, high-tech becomes low-tech with the lab's tornado simulator, an odd assembly of plywood, plastic, and duct tape. We're at the beginning of a study of wind, tornadic winds on building structures. When you're at the beginning of a scientific endeavor, typically you need to take risks, and risks cost money. And the best way of dealing with that is at a fairly low tech level. And so what you'll see is perhaps a little rough around the edges. The mini tornado is highlighted by a stream of neon filled bubbles and sawdust injected into the airstream. Otherwise, the whole thing would be invisible. You can't see wind. You can see what's in the wind. And when you look at a tornado video, you see debris flying around or dust flying around in the core of the vortex. Typically, you don't get to see the actual inside core of a vortex because it's surrounded by lots of debris and dust. So what you see in our simulator is, in fact, the inside core. Once the testbed winds are generated, Researchers carefully wire tiny models with plastic tubes called pressure taps to measure the forces on simulated building walls. High-speed computer readouts translate those wind forces into numbers for scientific study. While elsewhere, a similar kind of research is going on at real-world scale. It is a specialty of Texas Tech that we focus on full-scale testing, so we use natural wind in full-scale buildings. This is Werfel, Texas Tech's wind engineering research field laboratory. It is a full-size building that rotates so that any part of it can be pointed into the strong winds that are almost always blowing here, creating what amounts to a natural, real-life wind tunnel. This is the wind gust that we saw from the wind speed. Inside is a fortified safe room housing a computer. 
that samples the wind swirling around the building's exterior. The walls are studded with holes on the outside, feeding to plastic tubes on the inside, which channel wind pressure to electronic sensors. It is precisely the same system used in the wind tunnel lab, but on a much larger scale, and leading to information engineers and builders can use directly. Once you know the pressure coefficient, and that would be used to determine how many screws or nails you need to attach that panel to your roof rafters. The concrete block safe room is a must. Tornadoes are common here, and if one should ever strike this building, the scientists inside would be saved. And so would the information their sensors are collecting. If we were to have a tornado come across Werfel, the data that we would collect would be invaluable. Personally, as a researcher, I would not care to be there. I would care to look at the data that was collected afterwards, trying to learn lessons for the future from the damage of the past. But lessons for the present are critical for tornado survival today. Oh, Lord. Keep it going, Lord, and let it get north. Let it get high, Lord. Get it off the ground. Get it off the ground, Lord. After more than a century of terror in which tornadoes took a horrible toll, technology has now given us a fighting chance. Van Wert, Ohio is a small city of perhaps 10,000, a place that looks like it puts tradition and history ahead of science and technology. But in Van Wert, Ohio, looks can be deceiving. Closer 449, this is you. Oh my God, it's huge. Engine three, we're back on fire band, just reporting. We have a visual on this funnel cloud. In November 2002, the entire constellation of our most advanced tornado technology came together to save lives in Van Wert. Scott Schaefer was manager of the town's Twinplex movie theater on the day the tornado struck. Living in Van Wert, we uh, joke around a lot around town that you know, we always get missed by the storm. It always goes around us. But as the theater's wreckage shows, the storm did not go around Van Wert that day. What happened here became a focal point in a story of Van Wert's close call with death, as a monster tornado roared on a destructive path directly through the community. I had a feeling that morning that something was going to happen. It was a feeling that, uh, that was in the air. Rick McCoy runs the Emergency Management Agency for Van Wert County. The county has been certified under the Weather Service's new Storm Ready program. Certification means Van Wert is making best use of the full technological spectrum. On November 10th, 2002, it all went to work. At 1.40 that Sunday afternoon, McCoy heard his NOAA weather radio broadcast a report. The Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, was issuing a severe thunderstorm watch for the Van Wert area. McCoy took that as a cue to go to his control center and keep an eye on the situation. Less than an hour later, things got much worse. This is Debbie Hawaii at the Van Wert County Emergency Management with a special weather statement for all listening amateurs. At 2.45, Doppler radar at the National Weather Service detected the telltale sign a severe thunderstorm with strong rotation, the kind of thunderstorm that can produce a tornado. A tornado warning was issued for three nearby counties. McCoy knew that Van Wert would be in danger. I'm requesting spotters at this time. The sheriff in Blackford County reported this storm produced a tornado in Hartford City. Again, I'm requesting spotters at this time. In the nearby village of Wilshire, in the path of the coming storm, Volunteer fireman Dennis Bowen responded. He is part of the well-trained spotter network McCoy dispatched as his first line of tornado defense. I got to this point and uh, we started looking up at the sky. The clouds started doing a full rotation and there popped down the tornado. 
Bosher 449, this is unit 37. We have a tornado on the ground. I repeat, we have a confirmed tornado on the ground. Minutes later, the Weather Service issued its tornado warning for Van Wert County itself. It was 3.02 p.m. When a tornado warning is issued, it means that the tornado is imminent at that point, that it's approaching the area. And uh, my job at that point is to warn the public. Now, McCoy put his high-tech communication system into action. A key component is a specialized radio receiver called the Informer, placed in all public buildings and many businesses all over the county. It goes off with a, an alert or a siren uh, that will activate for about five seconds to get your attention. This is the Van Wert County Emergency Management with a special weather statement to National At the same time, McCoy set off sirens, technology dating from the Cold War, when they were there to warn against air raids that never came. Now they've been updated for 21st century tornado warnings. Seek a safe place in a basement. If that is not available, go to the center of your house. The final crowd spotted. Here to be on Glenmore Road, heading towards Van Wert. This is the Van Wert County. McCoy had deployed his spotter network in time. The entire communication system worked without error. As reports came in, he was able to trace the tornado's path with remarkable precision. They were able to tell me that it was getting larger and that was very important information that I continuously kept relaying to the public in the National Weather Service. And just as spotters were equipped with video cameras, so were residents all along the tornado's path. As common as it is, video technology is invaluable in preserving the experience. It's going up. Come here, look, real quick, real quick. Come here, Clay, there's two of them. Come here, you guys. You guys will never see this again, probably. Oh, my God. Oh, it sounds like a break. Oh, it does. Oh, my God. I can't even hold the camera still. <laughs> These remarkable scenes came from a camera once owned by Mark and Cindy Klinger. Transfixed by the approaching tornado, they were compelled to take these pictures. Earlier on the same reel of tape was their life, their home, their daughter, McKenna. They never suspected the danger awaiting them. Speed racer. Oh, honey, we need to go under something. Come on, come on. Okay. Get in here, get in here. Okay, go. Get underneath. Get underneath. The tape was removed from the damaged camera that was found in the wreckage of what was once the Klinger's home. surged ahead on its track of destruction through Van Wert. McCoy could see where it was headed, and he knew lives were in jeopardy. This is Van Wert County Emergency. As the storm was progressing through the county, it became very evident by the spotter reports that this tornado was heading towards the cinemas. On a Sunday afternoon, McCoy knew the cinemas would be full of children, unaware of the deadly storm's approach. The danger was critical. The theater was equipped with an informer emergency radio. The alarm tone went out, and theater manager Scott Schaefer prepared to act on McCoy's message. This is the Van Wert County Emergency Management. We have a tornado on the ground, Lincoln Highway, 224, approaching the Twin Cinemas, Van Wert Emergency Management. I was panicking, I was scared. I guess I've said I was too scared to panic. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's what I feel the best of saying. Despite his fears, Schaefer and the theater employees got everyone out of the auditoriums and into the central hallway and bathrooms, the safest places in the building to be. In minutes, the tornado was upon them. I was crouching down in the hallway with like the old school position they teach you, the hands over the head and down between the knees. I didn't have time to stop and think what exactly was going on. I was just hoping we'd make it out of there alive.
first information that came into my office at the theater was that maybe everyone had lost their lives. Van Wert's twin cinemas took a direct hit. In the auditorium where children had been sitting, the winds had tossed two cars directly into the seats. But thanks to a system that worked, no one here was even injured. And then as we got information later that uh, everyone there was okay, it was a very wonderful feeling that everyone was able to survive an F4 tornado. Intelligent use of technology made the difference in this community. Whether it was something as complex as Doppler radar or as simple as the sirens, sirens that Mark and Cindy Klinger heard. And don't fall down. Yeah, careful. The Klingers are the couple who videotaped the tornado as it came within yards of their home. They and their daughter McKenna survived, even if their house did not. As the storm approached, they knew what to do, quickly huddling in the crawl space under the floorboards. It was just enough to save their lives. I just grabbed hold of McKenna and Cindy and just held on tight and we... And the noise and the rumble was so loud, I kept screaming to my daughter, are you okay? And she'd yell back, yes, I'm okay. It was almost like the house exploded above us. Months after the tornado, Van Wert was still cleaning up, and it will be a long time before it recovers from the property damage. But property can be replaced. Lives cannot. Had it not been for the early warning system, the Storm Ready program that we had in place, we do know that we would have had hundreds that probably would have lost their lives in this storm. Scientists believe that the days when tornadoes killed hundreds of people in a season are unlikely to return. As they pursue their long-sought goal of understanding how tornadoes work, and as the instruments they use become increasingly efficient, we may one day be able to predict them with certainty. At that point, their awesome power will become a spectacle to see, but one that we no longer need to fear.